Hey guys, we're here for video two, which is going to be talking about the nature of matter and properties of water. Um, when we talk about the nature of matter, we have to talk about atoms. Atoms are the smallest particle of an element that has the properties of that element. So it's the smallest thing you can break an element into and it still have those properties. Um, you should remember from earlier in your elementary school that uh, atoms contain subatomic particles, and there are three. So think about those real quick. Let's see if you can remember them. Hopefully, you remember the proton. Protons are positively charged, and a lot of times we write them with a P with a plus sign on the top of it. They represent it as positive. They're found in the nucleus of the atom. Electrons are negatively charged, and they're found outside the atom, often in an electron cloud or energy level. And we write those as an E with a minus on to show they have a negative sign. Now, I don't know how much you remember, but an atom, if you have the nucleus of the atom here, it has electrons that float in electron clouds around the atom. Now, the first energy level can have only two electrons, no more can it have. And when this energy level gets full, then the next energy level can have eight electrons and no more. So this will be a total of this one that I'm drawing here, a total of 10 electrons. So if you had an atom that had 11 electrons, it would have another energy level and so on and so forth. Well you're going to have to know how many electrons are held in each energy level of the first three. So the first energy level holds two, second energy level holds eight, and third energy level holds 18. Now this is what an atom needs to be, what I call happy or stable. It needs to have this amount in each one of the energy levels. And it must fill up the first energy level before it goes to the second, fill up the second before it goes to the third, and so on. Now, the third subatomic particle is a neutron. A neutron has no charge, but it's also found in the nucleus. And we would write it as an N with a zero on top of it. So it has no charge whatsoever. So now if I were to draw real, real briefly a little sketch for you. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Well, let's go on here. This would work perfectly. Um, this is a picture of a lithium atom. I know because it has three protons, has three electrons, and lithium is number three on the periodic table. Now, this is actually an isotope of lithium because instead of having three neutrons, most atoms when they're stable have equal numbers of neutrons, electrons, and protons. Instead of having equal numbers, it has only two protons, which I mean uh, neutrons, which are represented here by the green. So this is a lithium isotope. Now, how I figured that out, if you look up here, lithium is right here. Lithium is number three. That three tells me it has three electrons and three protons. Now, if I went to carbon, carbon has six. So it has six electrons, six protons. So that means it has how many energy levels? It means it has two. That's right. It has two in the first and has four electrons in the second. So if we went to something like sodium, for example, which is number 11, it would have three energy levels, two in the first, eight in the second, and one in the third. So sodium would have 11. All right. Now, the number of protons usually equals the number of electrons. I've already told you this. So the overall charge of the atom is neutral. Now let me show you this one more time, what, what I mean. So lithium has three electrons, it has three protons, and three neutrons. So it has three negatives, three positives, and three that really don't count for anything. So if you add these together, it gives an overall charge of atom zero. But what's the charge of the nucleus? Now remember, the nucleus has the protons and the neutrons in it. These have no charge. So the nucleus has a positive charge. So the nucleus will always have a positive charge because that's protons. But usually the overall charge of an atom is neutral. And if you have an atom that has different numbers of neutrons, it's called an isotope. Now, isotopes are a lot of times unstable, or, or like I want to say, unhappy. Uh, so they're explosive a lot of times. But normal carbon is called C12. It's called C12 because it has six protons and six I mean, excuse me, six neutrons, which equal 12 things in its nucleus. C13, C14 would have six protons, seven neutrons, six protons, eight neutrons, etc. You see how it, how it goes on down the line. So these are isotopes, so know what they mean. And the last little thing, kind of switching gears a little bit, when two or more atoms of different elements are combined, then it creates what we call a compound, such as water, H2O, and the two elements are hydrogen and oxygen here that are combined 
to make this compound. Now, how are compounds made? There are three different ways, and this will be a listing question on the test. Um, there are three different kinds of bonds. The first one is a covalent bond. Anytime you see CO, co, think together. So covalent bond actually means a sharing of electrons to become stable. And basically how it works is this. Um, if you look over here to the left hand side, hydrogen has one electron, but it wants to have two. So what it will do is oxygen will give it an electron. That electron will float around oxygen, but it will also float around hydrogen. And hydrogen thinks then it has two. And it'll do the same thing for this one. It'll float around the oxygen and it'll give it it'll let it borrow one or share one. So it thinks it has two. And hydrogen in turn allows oxygen to get its electrons to flow around it. So I think it has eight on the animal shell. So they kind of fool each other into believing that they are they are full. And this is the strongest type of bonds and probably the, and it's the most common types of bonds. Most molecules have, are formed by covalent bonding. And I, I didn't mention this. Uh, Van der Waals forces is what the force is when these covalent bonds are sharing. It's kind of like the positive negative force, the, the attraction of the molecules that holds them together. The next type of bond is a little bit more complicated. It's ionic bonding. Ionic bonding is whenever an atom gains or loses an electron to become stable. And when it gains or loses an electron, it becomes an ion. Now, if you look up here, sodium is number 11. So that tells me it had one electron right here, right there. Had one electron right there. It had, you know, if you count them, two and eight make 10, 11. So it has a choice. It can either lose that one or gain seven electrons to become stable. So it chooses to lose one, and it often binds with chlorine, which is number 17, which has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons in the outermost energy level. This one came from sodium. So it can either gain one or lose eight. Now, I know what you're thinking, but you said the third energy level can hold 18. That's true. But any energy level after number two, if it has eight electrons, is stable or happy. So this chlorine really wants to get one. So what happens is we end up with sodium, which is normal. Oh, oh, let's go back here. Technical difficulties. All right, we end up with sodium. Sodium is has normally 11 protons and 11 electrons, which gives it a zero charge. But if it loses an electron, that makes this 10. That makes its overall charge positive one. Chlorine is usually 17 electrons and 17 protons, which is a zero charge. But if it gains an electron, its overall charge would be negative one. Well, you always have heard opposites attract. Well, this positive and this negative created by the different numbers of electrons are what pull and hold sodium and chlorine together. Now, the last one is hydrogen. It's probably the easiest one. Hydrogen bonding is going to be found in anything that has a hydrogen in it. So water would have hydrogen bonding. Uh, another one would be glucose, C6H12O6 would have hydrogen bonding. Uh, sodium chlorine would not have hydrogen bonding. It does not have a hydrogen, so it does not. So anything that has a hydrogen in it would be considered hydrogen bonding. The next one is mixtures and solutions. Mixtures and solutions, a mixture is a substance in which the individual components retain their properties. Um, I like to think of it like this. If you mix marbles and sand together, that would be a mixture because you could still separate the marbles and sand pretty easily. Uh, a solution, on the other hand, is when one or more substances are distributed equally in one another, and they basically take the properties of, a, they, they lose their properties. I gave you a picture of a Kool-Aid down here at the bottom, perfect example. Uh, when you pour Kool-Aid in water, you have water and you have Kool-Aid. You could even add sugar. Um, but they combine to make one thing and they're not easily separated. So two parts of every solution are the solute and the solvent. The solute is what's being dissolved. The solvent is what does the dissolving. So if you look at Kool-Aid, the solute, the solute would be the Kool-Aid, the powder, okay? And water would be the solvent. Now if you look at another one, if you think of tea, for example, tea and sugar would be the solute, and water again would be the solvent. Water is most of the time the solvent of things, and we'll see about that in just a minute. 
Now, the next little thing kind of switch gears again is the pH. pH is a measure of how acidic or basic something is. An acid is a substance that forms hydrogen ions in water. I'm not real concerned about you knowing that. Uh, but you do need to know it's from on the pH scale from 0 to 7. Uh, a base is a substance that has hydroxide ions in water. I'm not real worried about you knowing that, but you do know that a pH is from 7 to 14. So here's a better example. Uh, on this scale, from 0 to 7 is an acid, and from, from down here to here is an acid, and from here to here is a base. Now you see alkaline. You probably have heard that term before in alkaline batteries. Alkaline batteries are just mean to have bases inside of them, so it's a base. Now, there's a real good chart in your book, if you'll look, of different common bases and acids. But one other thing I want to mention, if you have something that has a pH of 6 and something that has a pH of 4, 4 is more acidic, but even though 6 is an acid, it's more basic. So it'd be the same thing here. If you had a pH of 9 and 10, this 9 would be more acidic than 10, and 10 would be more basic. So they love throwing that kind of um, trick question at you on the EOC, so, so pay attention to that. Um, the last thing is water and diffusion. Perhaps the most important compound of all living things is water. We're made up largely of water. Now, there are several properties that you need to know. First is polarity. Water mm -hmm. has poles on it. It has positive and negative ends. So if I were to draw a water molecule, you have an oxygen molecule, and you have two hydrogen molecules. The oxygen molecules will have a negative charge. The hydrogen molecules will have a positive charge. If you remember, hydrogen only has one electron, and it loses that electron. It becomes more positive. Oxygen gains the electron, so it becomes more negative. Polarity means it has opposite ends, and this allows water to dissolve most things. And this is very, very important. If, they, if I was going to ask you a question on the, on the test about water, polarity is probably what I would be asking you. So what gives water the ability to dissolve things? Polarity. Um, the next thing is resistant temperature change. If you've ever been to the beach uh, on prom weekend, you know that water resists temperature change. I mean, it can be beautiful, 98 degrees outside, and you jump in the water and it's cold, and it's very, very cold. It's because water is very slow at changing temperature. This is really why our climate stays the same in North Carolina. It's because our water resists temperature change, and we live so close to the water. Uh, the next one is water expands when freezes. Now, this isn't really important to us, but it's really important to a fish. Because it becomes less dense, it floats, so that ensures that the whole lake or pond doesn't freeze over. If you were a fish, that would be very important. Uh, and the last one is adhesion. And I put down here a graduated cylinder. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever looked at a graduated cylinder before, but in a graduated cylinder, the water will adhere to the sides and create what we call a meniscus. And you actually read the bottom down here of the meniscus whenever you are looking on a graduated cylinder. All right, so adhesion is greater between glass and water than water and water. That's why you get this um, meniscus shape. All right, I hope that helps. I hope you're ready for um, volume two tomorrow, and have a good night. Bye-bye.